So my name is Stefan Tietz uh, from McKay Brothers and Quincy Data too. Uh, today I will be speaking about the mechanisms of release of Fed news and especially the September 18th big no taper decision and its effect on the markets. But before I do that, let me tell you a little bit about who we are and why we would want to study this. So McKay Brothers is a telco company. We design, build, own, operate, sell bandwidth on our, on our own networks. We're completely vertically integrated and uh, our claim to fame is that we're, we're the fastest. And this claim has uh, stood so far. We're the fastest between the CME and Cartwright, NY2, NY4, we are in uh, Piscataway soon, Halsey, and uh, you know, beginning of Q2, hopefully Mawa. So uh, we have also a sister company, Quincy Data, which uses the McCain networks to transport the data. And, and there again, obviously, we're the fastest. So why would we want to study this? There are many reasons. One of them is that um, you know, we, you can see here, we're not at DC yet, and we haven't built yet. So we need to understand the rules of the game before we do build to DC. And the rules are, as we will see, not super clear. Another reason is that it's, it's very rare to have such a momentous event that will have ripples all over the earth. And if you can actually time a release somewhere, and see its effect in London, Frankfurt, Milan, Tokyo, Hong Kong, Moscow. You can actually measure the best latency between the release points and any of those points. And that is great information for us because what we're trying to do is improve on the best latency. So we can actually gather information and understand where we could improve the best networks. Now, the third reason is because we're not just a network company. We actually also advise our clients. We research the data centers. We look at the maps of data centers. That's really hard to get. We look at the cable lengths between cages. We study the market data, different market data offers. For instance, the FPGA offer from NASDAQ is different from the normal market data offer. And it's obviously much more expensive. Is it worth it? How many microseconds? How many packets per day are different? You know, we study all these things to be able to advise the clients that we have on how to exactly calibrate their low latency infrastructure. So for all these reasons, we're very interested in this. So now what happened on September 18th? The decision was unexpected. The Fed decided to keep funding the US economy. And this had a big effect on the markets. And on September 19th, the market data research company Nanax published a piece saying, well, something was fishy with this release. It was not exactly as expected. So let, let's take a look at what they said. We'll see if they're right, uh, but essentially their claim is that nothing should have happened before. And, uh, uh, you know, the, the other interesting thing about the graph is that uh, Nanak says that those 10 seconds was the most heavily traded 10 seconds in the history of the markets of the United States, which, you know, makes them an interesting 10 seconds to look at. So once Nanak put out its piece, then it was taken over by Eamon Javers at CNBC. And let's hear what he has to say. But somehow information from inside that room appears to have traveled to Chicago early. According to the market analysis firm Nanex, it looks like it takes about seven milliseconds for data to travel between DC and Washington. So now it's out of the box, it's in the main news. And uh, then Virtue Financial published something saying, Nanex didn't have the right data anyway. You know, the analysis is flawed. And then the principal trader group of the FIA said, 
Well, you know what? The Fed changed the way they did release the news. This is no event. It was to be expected. Nothing happening. So you have many different opinions. You're not sure exactly who to trust. And uh, Bob and I are from physics. The only thing we trust is data. So the one thing that you got to go back to is data and see if you can bring some closure to that question. So let, let's first, before we look at the data, think about the way it works. So the news is released somewhere and it reaches a trading firm who's a low latency trading firm. And when it reaches the trading firm, the trading firm, they're really good at trading firms. So we'll take them, uh, you know, under five microseconds from the time it reaches their server to the time they send an order to the market. But then it's not there yet. You know, it has to reach the matching engine of the market. The order has to be transformed into trades. Then they have to be sent to the publishing engine of the market. And then the publishing engine timestamps the, the packet that it sends. It is then published received by all the trading firms and also by Quincy Data. Quincy Data will timestamp it again with a different timestamp on our machines. And then this is the data that we'll look at. So how does it look like? So first, you know, you have the column timestamp and it looks like infinite precision. So the last digits are actually nanoseconds. So NASDAQ publishes its timestamps in nanoseconds. It does not mean it's accurate to one nanosecond, obviously. You know, it's just the granularity at which they publish. But we can probably safely assume that NASDAQ being a very good and very efficient organization, they're, you know, synchronized atomically to approximately one microsecond. Maybe a little less, but you know, one microsecond is the right order of magnitude. So the one microsecond is the digits, which are three, three, zero. So on gold, you can see that the first message was published or timestamped by the publisher at three, three, zero microseconds after 2 p.m. And you can see that, you know, there are many trades. If you then go to the SPY ETF, almost the same thing happens, but it's 390 uh, microseconds. So it's a little slower. And, and you know, we, we haven't delved into this, but I think there's a real difference between those two numbers. And it's interesting that the trading companies that got the first gold trades may not have traded on SPY. Anyway, more, maybe more on this. Uh, so now we, I think, know that the data got out of the publisher 330 microseconds after 2 p.m. So is that compatible with a news release in Washington, D.C.? First, to answer that question, you have to understand how fast the news propagates. So the news propagates, and this is all the FCC registered paths that McKay brother every day painstakingly analyzes to make sure that the competitors don't catch up on us. So all those paths essentially link the CME, New Jersey, and DC. So I think we have very good circumstantial evidence and, and like we, we have good hearsay uh, also, which states that they are actually migrated paths between DC and uh, the CME and also between DC and New Jersey. And so based on that, you can actually compute the latency between the release point and the data centers in New Jersey and Aurora, Illinois. So if you do that, it's essentially the speed of light. Speed of light is a very good approximation to within 5%. So what it says is that if you release at zero in DC, you should arrive at one millisecond and nine microseconds in Cartwright and three milliseconds and 50 microseconds at the CME. 
all right, can we rule out a release in DC based on this? I'm not sure we can because, you know, the, the guys in DC may be not atomically synchronized. Maybe their clocks were a little, you know, off by one millisecond. So we can't really decide yet. What we really have to do to decide is also to look at the CME data and to see if the CME data could be explained with an early release. So suppose it was released at my minus 909 microseconds from DC and it reached at about 100 um, and uh, then it got published at 3.30 at cart rate. Those, you know, give or take it's a 100 microseconds, those are the right numbers. So then it would have arrived at 244, 2 millisecond and 440 uh, microseconds at the CME. So we should see the published trades only quite a bit thereafter. So let's look at the CME. So the CME is very different in terms of its time stamping. It only time stamps to within one millisecond. It doesn't mean that it's not accurate to one microsecond. We don't know that. Uh, but they certainly don't time stamp to a granularity of one nanosecond. And it looks like uh, gold was at one millisecond, somewhere, anywhere between zero and one, and uh, the uh, S&P was between one and two. That's the first time stamped from the publisher of the CME. But, you know, this is not uh, quite accurate enough, and we have records on our uh, machines of all the uh, packets to a microsecond precision. So we can actually do a little better than this, and we can actually recover a sub uh, uh, millisecond, a microsecond precision for the CME data. How do we do this? So this, this is a slightly complicated graph. It shows you the different publishing streams on the CME, and you can see the colors change when it's a different millisecond on the CME. So you can see that the uh, places where the color changes is actually pretty precise. You can locate this. And if you can locate this, you can actually locate when the CME clock, you know, clock from one to two millisecond. So then with the records that you have on your own computers of receiving the market data, which is at the microsecond level, then you can arrange those two information a little bit like a vernier uh, scale measurement and recover microsecond of uh, the order of microsecond precision on the CME messages. Now, if you do that for the different publishers of the CME, because we, you know, we want to really understand the system, there the gold channel behaves funny. So the gold channel seems not to be synchronized as well as the other channels. All the other channels are synchronized well. Uh, the little variation is due to the load in the engine, most probably, but the gold is bizarre. So let's discard the gold data, because when we don't understand it, it's better to discard it. We don't need it, actually, to prove the point. So when we do this analysis, and by the way, the whole analysis will be available on the paper on our website, which goes into you know, some detail in this, then when we do the analysis, it turns out that the uh, e mini was timestamped at 2.1 millisecond by the publisher of the CME, and which means that it was received quite a bit before inside the CME data center because CME is not as fast as NASDAQ in terms of the processing time. So we can, based on that information, completely rule out a uh, contemporaneous, uh, a single point of distribution in DC. So, you know, what happened? Like, you know, if it wasn't released in DC, and I think that we can establish, we have established this, what happened? And, and what were the rules? You know, that, those are the big questions. So, you know, let's ask Eamon what the rules were. 
The Fed won't answer that question. They will not say what exactly the rules were. We're trying to get some more clarity from them today, but I've asked I mean, them that question again this morning. I, mean, they they don't don't have an I, I don't get it. They, the Fed won't even say what the rules are. And yeah, what, that's what's. You know, that's what's really bizarre. You know, I cut him short, but that's strange. So what we need to do, and if we need to decide to build to DC, we need to understand the rules. Not only do we need to understand the rules, we need to understand the rules and the process by which they change. It's not sufficient to understand the rules now, because if the news is released under lockup in DC, then the microwave networks are worth a lot. If the news are released in embargo in the data centers, then the microwave networks are worth nothing. So if you build, you know, a thousand kilometer microwave network and the Fed just changes the rules without even telling you, then a big investment goes down the drain. So it's, it's something that we really need to understand. And what's funny is nobody really wants to discuss the rules. So even Javers from CNBC has very funny quotes about this. He went to see the uh, news agencies, Dow Jones, Reuters, you know, Bloomberg, uh, the uh, Alpha Flash guys. And the answer from these guys is we comply by the rules of the Fed. And that's great, but they won't discuss what the rules are. So we're back to the question, what are the rules? So let, let's pause a little bit, and, and if you have questions, it might be a good time. Uh, but those are discussion points. The first thing actually is this, we're discussing this, but the reason we're discussing it is also a question to me. Because why would anyone be in the book anyway at this time? This is a time where the market could go either up or down by quite a bit. And you really gain nothing by being in the book at this time. So if economics was a real science and uh, the assumption about people being rational was a realistic assumption, we should have nobody in the book. And yet there are innocent bystanders still in the book. You know, it's, I, I guess it's great for the people trading against them. So that's the first kind of surprise question. But suppose like people are actually there and you'll always have that layer of people who are innocent bystanders staying in the book. So suppose that's true and it's still an interesting topic. What is the best way to release the news? Lock up? in DC, embargoed in all the different data centers, outside trading hours, uh, you know, there are other ways of doing it. You know, the, the luck up way of doing it is the one that you can, in theory, control because it's a single point of control. So the Fed can actually, you know, really exactly establish what the rules are. The embargo mechanism in some ways it's better because it's uh, released everywhere and you don't, we don't need to build uh, the micro networks. The guys trading on it don't need to buy our, our service. So it's cheaper for them to build, to, to, uh, to actually trade on this. It's not something that economically is very worth doing, you know, transporting the data. If it was there already, it'd be great. So uh, lockup has its advantages in terms of control, but it also has those advantages in terms of some kind of economic cost it imposes on the industry. But, you know, I think, and, and we, you know, as, as I said, we don't know the rules and we understand based on what uh, the Fed has said that they might have changed again the rules back uh, from embargo to lock up, and we were trying to detect this in the latest release, but there was no real move. So we're waiting for the next one with a big move to see what the rules are. So, um, so let's go back to discussing the lock up. So I think I think they went back to deciding that it was going to be a lock up, and uh, and then uh, 
how to do a lockup. What's the best way to do a lockup if you are to do a lockup? So really, you have no windows. You should have a Faraday cage to avoid any data transmission, especially from the microwave guys. It should be anechoic because you, you don't want sound propagation anywhere. You want no connecting pipes more on this. And obviously, you don't want to let anyone out of the room before 2 p.m. So how might this look? So first, anechoic. Yeah, it looks a little bit like uh, you know, something out of a, a movie. Um, then you have to go to a Faraday cage. And I think this is the punishment for the guy that leaked it, if ever. So that's, that's the extra Faraday cage for him. And then, obviously, you have to avoid any uh, physical connection between the inside and the outside. So one of the physical connections that everyone thinks about is the simple Ethernet wire, the thing that you will you know, enable at 2 p.m. But there are other physical connections that people have used before and toilets are one of them. You can tap on the plumbing and signal the news. So what do you do? You have chemical toilets. You know, and, and that is then the killer technology. All right, so with this, I will leave you and open that to questions.